That's what I'm saying. I, I think that's what you're saying. I think so, yeah. I just, it's, just, it's about being a little bit more accessible and a bit more relatable to people. I know, okay. big yeah. Parts, like in the past, like public enemy and things like mm. that nature of sex pistols, they were more politically open about their feelings yeah. and they were able to grow an audience. So I definitely feel like that's something that we can do more of nowadays mm -hmm. with social media and stuff. Yeah. So. But isn't, isn't it the threat? I mean, I have an artist and I keep telling her to, you know, she should tweet more. And she's not got the personality that makes her say, you know, she kind of thinks she's really boring because she's got this image. Mm -hmm. I'm saying people want to relate to the image, they don't want to relate to you necessarily. They want to relate to what they think you are. Yeah. And, and uh, it, you know, as she's becoming more known, that, that's, that's going to be the case. They want to relate to what she you know, not the person herself, but essentially basically the image that she's Well, isn't that more of what she, you know, it's, you know, we can be, in terms of what you're saying, <coughs> being yourself, you can be yourself or you can be your best self, okay? Or you can, you're just showing, she's just showing we, part of herself. We, we have these views yeah. about what, what our artists are. Mm -hmm. Chaps over there says there's no heroes. No, I, I don't necessarily believe. I think basically we live necessarily boring lives and we need to be able to relate to something outside of our own lives. And that's essentially basically what I want to start. If you bring them down to our level, then, you know, where are the heroes? So I think the I'll point is not just selling the person, as it said. This is a personal choice of the artist. It's mm. selling the person or selling the persona yeah. what you want to represent for the fan, I think. So in both cases, this just works. Anyway. So, it's, so it's up to you, it's your choice, the way you want to market. You can make yourself look in a superhero and uh, if people believe you then uh, your fans will relate on that basis or or you want to show you know your real side your uh, core values or the thing that will relate to these other aspects so very, very, very Regardless, 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 it's still essentially basically marketing. I think the mechanism is the same. It's up to you to choose which kind of, uh, I think, content to mm, blog yeah. it's, it's, up, it's up to you. I agree with you. Yeah. But the, the, you know, the, the point I'm making is that, like it's, it's like I say, we are in a two-way conversation now. And if we're in a two-way conversation, then people are essentially going to want to know more about us than... Um, than just the music. You know, if it's, it's your choice, you know, as if you're an artist, if you just want to present your music to the world, then that's fine and you don't, you don't want to present anything else apart for, uh, aside for, um, in terms of who you are to the world, then that's up to you. But even, you know, back as far as, you know, it, this is, even at this point here, where we're talking about radio, print and TV, you know, what, if, you know, what teenage girl if she was interested in Aha or Duran Duran, didn't want to know every single thing about those people. So they were still here. Exposure, it's exposure, it's thinking what you want to share. Yeah. When you have the social media, you can share stuff. There's a need, you need to share everything. You don't need to share everything. I mean, it is, and also, it's, it's not, sometimes it's just not appropriate to share everything. Okay? <laughs> yeah. This is music. Isn't that what we do? Isn't that what we, or, I mean, we write our feelings. Yeah. Isn't that what we do? We expose ourselves, either way. What would happen if like John Phillips exposed that he was a child molester, or David Bowie a, a colossal bore, or, you know, <laughs> any of these other people? I thought that also part of what you're doing is you're, you know, as a performer, an artist, you're a bit of a shaman, and you're focusing, you know, the broken pieces of people's lives through a trick of light. You know, I, sometimes there's a, a contradiction between everyday life and what you are on stage. There's all, I think there's always this. Maybe that's interesting too, I don't know, maybe. Despite well, the fact that this is quite interesting to talk about, you know, how much you should share and how much you shouldn't share, I think we're completely off the yeah. point of that, which is focus on the fan. I think what, what this says is that right now, back in the days where you didn't have all the social medias, when you were announcing a gig, you were just announcing a gig. Now when you announce your gig on Facebook, people can comment on it, people can say stuff, you know, they can ask questions about the game and all stuff, and you are able to reply to that. And you should reply, you, you can now talk to each fan individually and let them know about what you're doing. And it doesn't have to do with, you know, per sharing your personal life, whatever. it's about connecting with one fan at a time rather than connecting with a mass of people. Thank you. But then I think that the industry almost has, there are some people who were actually famous for being so reclusive that the fans loved it for the fact that they didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. They didn't really, and some, there are some that still do that now. Yes, Steve. Uh, 
you yep. say the others. Yep. And, and if you really want to shift units, how much time do you have to devote every fan, that, you know, a proper quality relationship? It seems a bit difficult. Every case is different. Yeah. Which way, you do, so you and all your money can help me choose to do it, which works for you, uh, for your, for your Yeah, absolutely. It's not, yeah. And, uh, <coughs> it's, like heavy metalism is an area where the, the dedication to fan base is specific fans. You can mm -hmm. remember it's small and everywhere. Um, uh, but how much they know about the fans other than that, I don't know. They, uh, but it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's it's, I'm not. I'm not really talking about. We'll have to move on to the next um, habit. But this is not so much about how much the fans know about you. It's about how much the fans relate to you. Yeah. Well, that's with social media. That's far easier for you actually yeah. to control. It's, this is about the relationship. It's not about you know if you want them to know the in, you know the ins and outs of your life. Then you know that's up to you. But this is about building a relationship with the fans, okay? Focus, like you said, focusing on the fan, building a relationship with them. And it is easier to build a deeper relationship with your fans if you can relate to that person on more than one level. You have, you will, by token of relating to that person on more than one level, you will have a deeper, um, stronger, and, and a, a sort of relationship that has far more longevity with them. I think just yeah. I think I will more relate to what they have said. Or that mm. You cannot really pretend you're a superstar with a wall, you know, like away from people. Mm. You cannot do that. You just, this is this, this is the standard thing. You cannot do that. So it's up to you how you will nurture and use this relationship because it exists. It's two way, and it's up to you how you're going to use it. But you cannot pretend that there's no social media, there's no two way. Um, well, communication, you know, you cannot assume that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on. Ask for the money and look after the money. You have to ask for the sale. Right? Now, whether it's you that asks for the sale, or if you don't like asking for the sale, then feel free to delegate that to the manager and get them to ask for the sale. But you need to, you know, it's as an entrepreneur, you're building an enterprise and you're setting a bar in terms of how much revenue you want to create. Okay? And I'm not, um, you know, it, we're not talking about 30,000 here, you know, that you want to live on. We're talking about, you know, a million turnover in a year if you're a, a, a thinking of being an enterprise. Okay? If you're an independent musician and you want to build your team, are you looking at, you know, creating 100, 150,000 pounds per year? For you, as then this is like your lifestyle business here, and that's just for starters, okay? So you, you do need to ask for the money, right? You won't, it's, it's entrepreneurship, making money is it's about sales. And this is again when I thought, you know, we could kind of go back to the marketing and the PR idea, and, you know, getting loads of fans and creating buzz. You know, at the end of the day, you do have, you know, we do have to think about tying our marketing into a physical strategy, right? And looking after your money, um, financial literacy. So thinking about, so profit and loss, cash flow, sales forecasting, balance sheet, all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to know that, you know, you have to do all of that stuff. It's like you were saying, do it initially and delegate it, but, but, but do educate yourself in terms of how the inner workings of that um, of how that works, actually, and um, and then move on. So you actually have the big picture, but it's actually delegated to someone else. So, for example, um, in my business, like right, right at the beginning, I would do all my accounting and all you know, all my books and stuff like that. And I, you know, quickly found that the big, you know, things that I spent money on would be travel, petrol, car, that kind of thing, because I was always going to meetings. And that was actually useful to know. I was like, okay, now you know, I see where you know you actually understand your outgoings. It's a very like small thing. To think about, but it's useful to know where your money is going, right? Um, I really do think that how financially literate you are it ties into how much money you actually make. Yeah. 
Do you think Justin Bieber is financially literate then? <laughs> I think he has. I think he has management around him. That yeah, he does. He has yeah. people around him. He's not. He's. You know, he's uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, we can, no, I think we can say with uh, a good degree. But, <laughs> um, but, but people around in this room, you know, you're saying you have financial acumen. That's all very well. But I think they want to hear about how can I get the finances to worry about them in the first place? How can I earn the money in the first place? What's the path? What's the secret? What's the holy grail? That's what they want to know. It's they... asking for the money and doing the deal. Okay, give me uh, £10,000 and I'll promote you personally on my app, the work I do. There's asking, you know, there's asking in doing the deal, but in what context? Are you actually saying okay, that? But, These independents yeah. in this room, they are independents. They don't know record producers or people that run gigs. They don't have those contacts that you're saying ask for the money. These are <laughs> real people here. They're not, you know, manufactured just them beavers or whatever. <coughs> How do they ask for the money in here? Who are they speaking to about asking for the money? Okay, so the way you start again is by networking. Okay, so you, you, you go out, you network, you have a, a good idea of who you're looking for. Okay, also the other thing as well is you have to have a, an understanding of what you have to offer. Right, because you can't do a deal with somebody, or you can't do, create a partnership or a collaboration with someone unless you have something to offer and they have something to offer you. Now, that could be from, um, a, it could be a non-financial deal in terms of what I was saying, when you ask for help, so you're actually helping each other, okay, and you actually create something that's bigger, or it could be a case of, I have a list, I have content, let's bring that together, and that's how we create the deal, and that's how we actually create revenue. But that is an example of asking for the money. Yeah? Sorry, sir? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, no, I don't believe that uh, you are answering my questions at all. So I'm just interested in listening to your opinions here. Thank you. Okay, so sorry, but just elaborate. How does that not answer your question? Because I think, again, I have to say, I think these guys are real people in this room and they are, you know, we have dreams and aspirations. We have music, they have music, they want to get their music out, they want to earn <coughs> money. How can they really do that? I, um, I just think it's, uh, there's it, no secret, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure it's not a secret, it's, it's chance and it's luck and it's being very talented. So what else can they put in place to, uh, to, to, to earn the money? Okay, I have a question for you. How deep is a record label roster? I would have no idea. Okay, because um, what I hear in the room is this idea of manufactured bands and um, lots of money being spent, okay? Now, the truth of the matter is, when I was at RCA, I had 40 artists, and 35 of those were, like, were operated like independents. Five of those were superstar artists, okay? 35 of those had little to no budget. And 35 of those were all managed through doing deals um, and through collaboration. Okay? So it's a fallacy to think that major labels don't understand when, uh, uh, how the independent <coughs> market works, because the majority of their roster are actually small artists. Okay? And it's very easy to focus on the superstar artists, on the Shakiras, on the Justin Bieber's on the, uh, the Beyonce's and say this is all the, all the major labels do and this is all that they are. But it's an absolute fallacy. So if you go away and you look at, do you have a CD collection at home? Or is it all digital? No, I have both. Uh, so the 35, tell us about those. How did they earn their money? How did they earn income? They did it the same way all the other independents do. They did it through gigging, they did it through CD sales, they did it through that, they did it the same way. Kickstarter. Okay. If you want money, if you're a small band and you have a fan base, just make a Kickstarter campaign. That's asking for money. 
Yeah. That's so t shirts. Yeah, I mean, there's so many other ways. If, if, if you want to meet the people who will give you the money, then you know, go to networking events or go and meet the people, send emails, send emails to, to record labels and be like, look, we've got this album coming out, we want money to release it. You know, they might sign you, they might come and listen to you, they might send you somewhere else. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much logical. If you want to find the people who will give you the money, you need to go and find them. And you need to work for it. But the secret is work hard for it. And there's no there's no real secret. The only way to make money is to sell tickets. Nobody will buy your music anymore. Wasn't there something um, where the government gives money in terms of a loan for professional development in terms of if you want to do music or whatever? I know mm. the government gives money. So is that something that we could do as musicians if we don't listen? Independently, or do we have to start a company? If you go onto the Music Tag website, you should find a list of all the companies that will that will um, that are available for grants. Music Tag. Music Tag. <coughs> yeah. Music study. Music. Right. So does then somebody else have a question? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just want to make uh, TV. Uh, thank you. Go into your point about how natural education and literacy mm -hmm. basically, you know, the more literacy you have. More likely you are to make money. And I think it's absolutely true, but it's, it's not just that. There's also another point about the very fact that people who can make the money, you know, people win the lottery every single day. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to keep the money. Absolutely, it's about when yeah. you have the money, what you're going to do with it. Yeah, yeah. So um, having that financial literacy that you were talking about, things like cash flow jobs, which we were saying that, mm -hmm. so it's not just about making money. That essentially basically is the easier part than actually having to spend money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, looking like it was like the side, but looking after it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, but you can. There are ways of raising the investors as well with tax breaks, through, uh, which you can apply for. And, uh, basically, just be anyone who invests in, in your in your company and gets related. The what most of the lose is twenty eight percent. So there's a few schemes around like that. The PRS has something as well that's helping people. Out yeah. Maybe, yeah. Quite difficult to get into this, fully subscribe to this particular one. But, uh, it, so, yeah, again, there's people that are really starting out in, but not really up at starting out, I mean, not right at the bottom. You think, oh, maybe I'll start a band and they'll give me some money. You've got to actually be doing it like most of us here have for a good three years. And, uh, and they can see that, uh, you know, you've been gigging, you produce your own CDs and stuff like that. And uh, you can get some help from that. There's a quite a few of those things around. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, well, like most people, most of the bands, I'm sure a lot of people here will have produced their own CDs and buy them up and then some sell them and go out and they get their own gigs, stuff like that. And once you're doing that, there, there is some there is, uh, there is help. Yeah, I mean, your, your, yeah, your point about bringing something to, ta to the table um, is really key. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, some, if Let's say we're going to do something. Yeah, you and I are going to collaborate. You want to know what you know I can offer you. You want, and equally vice versa. Because not to, not just because it's the, it's not necessarily the exchange, but if I don't have something to offer and then you don't have something to offer, well, there's that also. But we can't build something. Okay, we can't pool our resources and we can't make something of what we have. Right. So we thought it's it, so it's not it's not just about generating interest, it's actually pulling resources together and make something more of it. Yeah. And something that maybe follows up on what the gentleman said. Uh, I believe that first of all you need to start by hiding um, having extra value in what in what you do. Not just doing what everybody else does. Mm. So basically if you think as a technological startup, what they do is they differentiate, they add more market value or any kind of value, brand va value, something, brand value, sorry. And then, if you're looking for an investor, then who's going to stand out if you start persuading them? The, 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 the band, the brand, the tech startup with a more added value is going to get more interest. Mm -hmm. I see that there is the trend of investors going for intellectual property. Yeah. Actually, Absolutely. I went to Singapore in September to meet some investors for my own bank, mm -hmm. because there is this tendency over there in Asia. Mm. They try to, to fund bands, 20 grand, 
and they will get some money with, with a business model they each bet has. So this is a way of, yeah. maybe we'll exaggerate in the future, but this is something more like a tendency of having bands to adopt and change and become business as well. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the technological startups came, came out, mm -hmm. they were just companies with just a simple structure, and then the investors came and they had to adopt and think about business plans and return on investment and everything else. Maybe the same thing for the band. So added value, it's something you're very important here. Yeah. 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 Can you elaborate on the 20,000? That's interesting. Something yeah. you like to <laughs> So do they, yeah, like how, does that, how does that come about? Like, how do they, how does that I'll, I'll go in September, so if, yeah. if I get the money, I'll tell you. Okay. Maybe I'll have to talk about it. So. <laughs> it's a new concept. Okay, so market smart, smart meaning specific, measurable, achievable, um, realistic and targeted. Um, I've already gone into this quite a lot anyway, talking about the DIY marketing, so I won't go into it anymore, but it, it just basically tie your marketing into a fiscal strategy. Alright, so habit number six, a positive profile and prolific output. Um, so a positive profile is, is really about um, well it's kind of up to you really, but it's um, it's how you manage your reputation and how you manage your um, How you manage your, your being and your energy and what you actually put out there. Now, for some people, it, for some artists, it might not be. It doesn't might not have to be completely positive, but it, it depends on what you want to put out there, as we've already discussed. But um, from a business to business aspect, okay, if as a as a business doing business with other people, then you're going to want to at least look like you're easy to work with. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and being prolific and being prolific with your output. And what I mean by prolific output, the people that produce, the people that put loads of, of work out there, the people that is so because again, you know, we have the internet, that those are the people that tend to be more influential um, in this climate. Right. Number seven is know your pitch. Now, I'm not saying we're not we're not pitching to fans here, okay? Well, what I mean, I mean, in a way, you kind of want to include an idea of, of of what you're pitching to fans, but you're not actually pitching to fans. This is in terms of when you're networking and when you're talking to people and when you're you know asking for the money, trying to collaborate or partner with people so you can create something that's really great. Is knowing knowing what you have to offer and how to relate that to people. When you, as, an, as a music business entrepreneur, um, whether you're an artist or you're looking to create an enterprise, um, when you are out there you know, attempting to create revenue, really what you're going to be doing is you're going to be talking to other businesses. Right? So what I mean is that we're not talking about selling one MP3 to one fan. Okay? Um, what I mean is you want to find the people that have the audience, find the business that has the audience and talk to that one person and collaborate with that one person so you get access to their audience. Right? So when you're in that kind of environment, you, you really do need to know, have, a, have an idea of, of what you're saying to them. Now, with a pitch, it's not about being really salesy um, and really sort of really aggressively, um, you know, aggressive and, um, you know, that kind of uh, idea. Really, it's just about being clear. So you communicate what you um, have to offer in a clear way. So they get it straight away. They get straight away what you're trying to do. They get straight away what, uh, what your, you know, problem you're trying to solve. Um, if you're talking kind of about sponsorship and like demographic and things like that, yeah. would you not need to have some sort of cause and some passion at, at that point before you can have Yeah, um, or is that something you think you can do on the back before you're in a pitch? Um, what, so, okay, so, so that's kind of moving away from pitch, okay? So, um, again, it goes back to what I was saying to this lady here. 
yes, you absolutely. The more you have to bring to the table, the better you are, you know, the better position you are to 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 deal, to negotiate with anybody. Yeah. Pitch, though, still, you yeah. Understand, like, you know, about, like, have an elevated pitch, so you can mm -hmm. tell someone what you're doing, touch what you want. Um, but if you're starting out, what would be your pitch? What what would you include in your pitch? Because it's all your ideas and what you are aiming for. All right. Okay. So yeah. All right. So if you just have an idea, then it would be I have an idea for. Okay, and um, there are different stages of pitching and in, uh, in terms of what you're looking for. So at the moment, so for example, is I have an idea for this particular uh, band. You know, I have an idea, and my band is, and you would um, describe clearly what that is. So I now have an idea for this particular music business enterprise, and at that stage, you would literally you'd be pitching for rapport and pitching for relationships and contacts. That's what you. So you get. So what you're actually looking at is the people that actually will support your idea. Okay, and you'd be you'd be talking about you know how you're executing your idea currently. Okay, because an, an idea in a sense you know doesn't really have much value unless you actually execute it, unless you actually have action behind it. Right, um, and you'd be surprised when you actually talk in those terms how many people will support your idea. Yeah. And they'll be interested, in, and, and yeah, they'll be interested. They'll be like, well, you know, it'll be very. They'll, they'll have a relationship. They'll connect with you. They want to know how you're doing. Okay. So right, you might not have the the, the big asset like the big mailing list and, and all the um, you know all the music and the gigs and all that kind of stuff behind you right now, but you can <coughs> talk about. I have this great idea, and this great <coughs> idea. Um, is being executed this way, and I, this is what I think my idea can do for these fans, and this is how I think it can contribute because I'm putting this behind it, and, you know, in terms of your own effort. Yeah. So, um, habit number eight to get team and tech support, which we've already covered. Build a team. And um, look at the technology around you as well, which I'm sure we're all doing. <coughs> <coughs> Habit number nine, we covered this in Focus on the Fan, but communicate, communicate with your community. Not just your fans, but also your business community. And not just the music business community, but also the wider business community as well. This, this might yeah. be definitely a problem for people who are more introverts. Mm. Or if you have a big fan base, you don't have the time to do that. Um, well, if you have a big fan base, then um, it's you kind of like the way that you would manage that is that you would have to set the tone with somebody else and get help to manage that. And be upfront and about it, and say, "Well, look, you know, there's, there, you know, I have helped. This person is here to help me communicate with you, and I communicate through that person. I am also here as well, and I will be communicating with you. And I will be, let's say, for example, it's Twitter, and I'll be doing Twitter Q and As or Twitter interviews, or we'll be doing webcasts, that kind of thing. So your fans know you kind of already set the ground rules in terms of how you're communicating with the fans." Um, but you know it's it's fine to get help. This is kind of goes back to say you know you know the whole kind of idea of doing it all yourself. You know there you have so many fans. I, I think it's understandable that you can't communicate with them all the time. And you can broadcast your tweets. If you think about somebody like Jenna Marbles. Does anybody know Jenna Marbles? Okay, right. She's a she's a she's a current hit on on the internet. She's got she's got like a billion clicks. So many subscribers, and she does actually. She does it all herself. She doesn't actually reply to everybody. She can't reply to everyone. You can't. It's no. Of course you can't. I'm not saying that you have to reply to everyone. But as you get to know what people are saying, there will be trends in terms of what people want. You'll see patterns emerge. Most people want this. Most people like this. Most people don't like this. And that's what you address. So you you address what the trend is or the pattern. Okay. Yes, you can at some points address people individually, and that makes people feel, you know, really great and special and stuff. I actually, I did this with um, a text chat. Actually, it was with the Sugar Babes, and um, what we had was uh, it was a partnership. 
Nobody exchanged any money for it, okay? It was universal, the sugar babes, a little tech company called Flytex, and O2. O2 gave us the technology, and they gave us the, um, they gave us the media space on, on the internet or their website, that kind of thing. Of course, they had the sugar babes, and Flytex gave us the technology. And we all, we all did this for profile, okay? And the way we handled it is um, we gauged from all the fans the questions that they would want answered up front first. We actually asked them, we said, well, what do you want answered? What do you want us to select? Because, we, because there's a lot of prep that goes into that. So what do you want us to address? What do you want us to talk about? That kind of thing. So we asked them first. So we knew we had those answers prepared. We asked the band what exactly what they wanted, you know, what they would say. But we had also had moderators there that were fielding all the questions. And we actually did answer people's um, individual questions. The ones that were appropriate, we answered. Some very inappropriate stuff that actually came through. But yeah. So yes, uh, yeah. when you start out, first of all, you need to get your hands dirty. Yeah, and then as the absolutely. Grow, you even talk with each other. Yeah. And you answer questions like the hardcore fans say what you are supposed to say. Mm. And this is vibrant. So I guess at the beginning, you need to get your hands dirty yeah, to get this thing rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Another, another example I'll give you actually is that um, um, you can enlist the help of your fans. Um, I uh, managed to take that campaign. Loads of fans. Um, it was just me, and there was no in label help for me to manage all these fans. So on the mess on the forum, it was just the forum at the time. There were I asked and I said, look, does anybody want to help me manage this community? You know, and I can't pay you because well, the thing is, is that there's um, the reason you can't pay is because it brings up. Uh, difficulty with the chart rules. That's why. But um, but you know we can get you access to the band. You know give you gifts that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of those people, the the you know there were like five six of them. You know they were happy to do it because they just wanted to be involved and be close to the band. And it they did it for the experience. Okay. So, like I say, you know, there are people out there that will help because they will just they will do it for the experience. I'm not saying they'll do it forever. There'll be parameters around it, of course. Okay. But to get that leg up, those people are around. Okay. And habit number ten: give yourself a break. Okay. Give yourself a break. It's really important to take rest time, right? And I know that I think when we're doing our own thing, um, we we kind of just work at it non-stop. We're either, you know, doing terrible things like, you know, bringing the laptop to bed, okay? <laughs> That's terrible. It's a terrible way to, it's a terrible, you know, habit to have. Um, or working at you know working at the weekends or on the train just doing this all the time and you know find time to take a break. You know, it, 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 but you, you can get a phone later, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give yourself a break. It is otherwise you you never have time to do that big picture thinking and you know think about the strategy. Yeah. Mm. Give yourself a break. Say you're a normal person mm. and you work full time mm. and you're trying to kind of start up your own business, you're getting your hands dirty, you do yeah, yeah. Where would that come into play? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I've I've been there. Okay. Um yeah, it, it's it's you yeah, you just have to discipline yourself and actually you know, you have to it's 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 a discipline actually. Giving yourself a break, taking time off is a discipline. If you're the kind of person that's really passionate about what you do and you're hard working and you really want to make it work, um, and then the idea sometimes, and I suffer from this myself, the idea of taking a Saturday off fills you with dread and guilt. Okay? So I've, I've been there before and I sit there and think, oh God, I can't, how can I possibly take this, this time off? It's a discipline. Okay, um, and it's even if you start off by saying, I'm just going to take this. Look, uh, one of the things that they say actually is like, book a meeting with yourself. Okay. Right? Book a meeting with yourself, and it's your lunch break. Okay. All right? So if, I understand where you're coming from. You know, it's like, 
Ah, oh, I've got so much to do. Yeah. I can't do a night. And do you suffer from overwhelm at all? Sometimes, yeah. Right, okay. So, so there's this type. So, if you give yourself a break, you'll be able to handle the overwhelm better. Right? So, the first thing you do, if, if an hour is too much for you to handle, half, a, half an hour, right? <laughs> Take half an hour um, and go for a walk or do something that is completely, it's a non screen activity. But just get away from it, and that is giving yourself a break. Because actually, and I'm sure you're, you're fully aware of this, you'll be so much more productive if you do. Definitely, but it's just getting away from it. Yeah, <coughs> I, no, I understand. It's very difficult, but I think the idea, okay, it's like uh, one of the things that, you know, um, you know, I'm very lucky. I, 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 I have been an entrepreneurial community, and I have um, coaches and, and, and mentors, and one of the things that they say to me is, book your holiday. Like at the beginning of the year, book your two holidays, all right? Okay. Um, which at the beginning I was like, how can I possibly do that? I don't have the money, I don't have the time, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in six months' time. I don't know, I don't know. Um, so you start small. All right. Now, yeah, I'm kind of in this, I can kind of like conceive of that. But yeah, now I can. I'm a little way down the line. But at the beginning, when I, you know, when I had set up my, you know, my marketing and, and, and PR uh, agency, and I was I was doing all that stuff, and then you know, you know, from a personal point of view, I stopped doing that because there were so many people coming into the environment in digital marketing and PR that it just became it sort of became, from my perspective, it's like, well, I don't know if this is kind of like thing for me to do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then I, I moved off and went off and did a little bit of lecturing and, you know, and that was when I was extremely busy, okay, because I was doing, I was doing the lecturing and I was, I was setting this up. So it's, it's a, it's a discipline. So I would say, if you can, don't work through lunch. So 30 minutes, take a break. Take a break, go outside, the weather's nice now, so take it, yeah. And, start, and, and then from once you start doing that, it'll be okay. So you'll find ways of negotiating your own schedule. It's a bit difficult because I don't know your schedule. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> but you see what I mean? I don't know your schedule. But it's, um, it's once you give yourself that little bit of breathing space, okay? Don't take your phone with you or anything <laughs> like that, okay? Do you see? Yeah. But... It, and it's make sure, also the other thing is make sure that other people know that you're taking that break. Because other people encroach on our time. Right? So, okay, so this is the economic clock. Oh, um, this is the economic clock. So, um, this is how we gauge where we are <laughs> in terms of the downturn. And the reason I put this up is for your information purposes, because as an entrepreneur, it's useful to know this kind of stuff, um, even if you're an artist. Um, and we are round about here, there, and it's what we call hesitant recovery. Now, so what I'm saying is that if you're going to start, start now. And the reason you want to start now and really make some headroads with this kind of stuff is so that you can take advantage of an upturn that that is coming. Okay? So, there's that. Um, and where? Well, I covered that with phone. You have a factory in your pocket. But don't be. A, but take a break. Don't be available all the time. Yeah. All right. So <coughs> dealing with this. Moving on. So the finance stuff. I think we covered it in discussion. Learn it and practice it. Entrepreneurship is a practice. A lot of the time, you, a lot of the stuff you're just going to be learning on the job. Okay. So <coughs> get the information. Get people to give you tips, tricks, and tools. If you know, there's somebody out there that has a solution to your problem. You just need to, you know, talk to that person and find out what their solution is. Sometimes you don't always have to learn everything, by, you know, through your own mistakes. You can find a person that has that solution and just apply their solution to the problem that you have. Okay, okay and talking about innovation. Um, this is, um, so when we typically talk about innovation in entrepreneurship, we talk about this kind of big innovation, this big tech, and loads of research dollars put behind it, that kind of thing. It doesn't always have to be that way. It could be what we call little tweaks or what is known as soft innovation. So it could be um, new standards in quality experience and, and sales. So it could be the little things that you do every day that make things better 
that whereas the trajectory is is the innovation. So these little these little innovative improvements, if you like, and risk. So I said we'd come back to this. So risk. How do you manage risk? Calculated risk. Um, and risk management. There's lots of information out there on risk management. With risk, you, it's, you assess the risk, you plan, you safeguard, and you watch it. And this is something that we actually do every day in our everyday lives. It's just really about apply, applying that everyday life skill to what we do in our music business enterprises. So, some action points. Get a vision that's bigger than you. Um, for me, one of the big, um, you know, one of the important points with entrepreneurship is as much as we talk about money and innovation and business, I think it's really about how much the value that you're creating and how you're contributing and, who's, and the problems that you're solving. <coughs> And even if you are an artist, you can do that. The music is your vehicle for doing that. Right? How you do it is up to you, but it's, it's possible. Okay? Set smart goals. Get a business plan. So, and you want a forward plan with that. So three years, ten years. Get learning get help, and um, this is the one, the one point that I want to come back to from earlier on in the presentation, which is when you start off, you are going to fail. You're going to fail. Just fail as fast as you can. Get that stage done as fast as you can. Um, in the life cycle that I showed you, have that embryonic stage where I said that in times of technological disruption, there's a lot of experimentation. And that's why we hear how this is working, this particular part of the business is working, but that particular part of the business isn't working, how, you know, um, this is the trend, but that isn't the trend. That's because there's a lot of experimentation. This is where failing fast comes from. You're going to be testing stuff out, and some of that stuff is not going to work, and some of that stuff is going to work a little bit, and some of that stuff is going to be really successful. But each, each um, experiment... <coughs> gives you room, to, you know, gives, helps you to learn and gives you room to grow. But you want to get that over, you want to fail as fast as you can so you get through that stage at the beginning because with the industry life cycle, that's your business life cycle as well. Okay. Uh, 